Hi everyone, welcome back to Stay Current Podcasts. I'm M. Tom Bash, a research fellow at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And along with Stay Current, we are sharing knowledge to improve child health around the globe. In this podcast, we are going to talk about malrotation anatomy, presentation, diagnosis and treatment options with Dr. Mira Kodagal. My name is Mira Kodagal. I'm a pediatric surgeon at Cincinnati Children's. We have a lot to cover today. So if you're looking for a specific part like diagnosis or treatment options, make sure to check out time stops in the description. They'll take you wherever you need. Malrotation is a congenital condition that occurs in about 1 in 200 to 500 live births, making it a relatively common issue in pediatric patients. It is one of the most important causes of intestinal obstruction in infants and children. The severity of symptoms can vary, and early diagnosis and treatment are critical to prevent long-term health problems. But before we start talking about diagnosis and treatment, I want to take a step back to understand how malrotation happens anatomically. What are the differences in fetal development that cause malrotation? Now, Dr. Kodagal will explain. In the fourth week of gestation, that's really when we start to see development of the bowel. And as the bowel grows in length, it actually herniates into the yolk sac and along the umbilical cord and the SMA axis. We've all been there. I know it's hard to visualize the anatomy, especially challenging one like malrotation. For this reason, we added some animations linked below in the description. Don't forget to check them out. I promise it'll help you understand the concept better. It develops outside and continues to grow in length and then will actually go back into the abdomen with sort of two pieces of rotation. The first part of the rotation is a 90 degree rotation where the duodenal jejunal loop sort of rotates. And then you get the return of the rest of the bowel into the abdominal cavity with a 270 degree rotation of the cecum and colon. And that allows it to end up in the conformation that we consider it normal, where you have a duodenal jejunal junction to the left to midline at the ligament of trites. And then the cecum and colon around the abdomen, starting from the right lower quadrant all the way around to the left. Now is the time to check the animations linked below in the description if you haven't yet. We're now moving on. You can get errors at any stage in that sort of rotational return of the bowel to the abdomen. And those can result in that wide spectrum of anomalies. We used to describe rotation as either normal rotation and malrotation, and now we've gotten more into the language of talking about intestinal rotation abnormalities because they tend to fall more along a spectrum than the black and white of either normal or abnormal. Those can include both non-rotation and malrotation. With non-rotation, basically the gut goes back in but doesn't rotate at all. And so you end up with the colon on the left and the small bowel on the right, and you don't tend to have the problematic LADS bands that can cause obstruction as you see in malrotation. And so non-rotation anatomy actually looks a lot like the anatomy of a malrotated kid post LADS. Malrotation means that you get some portion of the rotation, but you don't necessarily end up with full rotation to allow for the broad-based mesentery which is what's important to reduce the risk of volvulus. So you can end up with some rotation, meaning that the small bowel is still all on the right and the cecum makes it part way towards the right lower quadrant, but not the whole way. And so you get lads bands that can be obstructing of that duodenal junction, or you can get different sort of anomalies within there. The cecum can still be on the left-hand side, but the small bowel mesentery is narrow. And that's what ends up causing your predisposition towards volvulus. Since we mentioned volvulus, we need to look into more rotation complications. What are we afraid of for these kids? Complications of malrotation, there's really two buckets that you have to think about. One are sort of obstructive symptoms, and you tend to see that with feeding intolerance and kids that may have issues around food getting past those lads bands in the duodenum. And the other one is mid-gut valvulus, which is the result of narrow mesentery. So when you have malrotation, and because of the way that the bowel aligns, the small bowel mesentery is not spread out from the left upper quadrant to the right lower quadrant, as you would expect, and you can get a narrow pedicle. It's easier for that pedicle to twist on itself, and then you get a mid-gut valvulus and ischemia of the intestine. About 1 in 200 children have a risk of malrotation, but only about 1 in 30 with of those children with malrotation will develop a valvulus. A lot of kids with malrotation may never be identified to have malrotation, or they may have mild symptoms of feeding intolerance and that may result in their evaluation and diagnosis. It's important to recognize that about 70% of those who will have a mid-gut volvulus will present in the first year of life. So as kids get older, if they never had a volvulus, their likelihood of having a significant clinical event related to their malrotation goes down. 
Very commonly, kids with congenital cardiac disease and heterotaxy especially can have associated malrotation. The data seems to suggest that in those kids, their likelihood of having a symptomatic event, whether that is feeding intolerance and bilious emesis or actually progressing to volvulus, is much lower. So we don't tend to fix the kids who have heterotaxy and malrotation with the same frequency that we might for another child in their infancy. The other thing to remember is that rotational abnormalities are also associated with certain diagnoses that are very commonly seen in pediatric surgery, and they're just the result of the nature of the anatomy of those diagnoses. So that includes congenital diaphragmatic hernia, gastroschisis, and emphalocele. In the neonatal period, the most critical symptom to be really aware of is bilious emesis. Even if they have a normal appearing x-ray, those kids really need to be evaluated for mid-gut volvulus. You have to be able to really understand that because the risk to missing it is so high. And so bilious emesis is the most common criteria for us to evaluate a kid for malrotation. But there are other things that you can see, like feeding intolerance, abdominal pain, abdominal distension. You can get some late signs associated with volvulus, but at that point, it's usually reflective of the intestinal ischemia. So you can get bloody stools or peritoneal signs on exam, abdominal wall erythema. All of those are more suggestive of a later stage in the process and concerning for progression of intestinal ischemia. So the differential diagnosis for bilious MS is actually quite broad and includes basically all kinds of intestinal obstructions. So it includes atresia, Hirschsprung, disease, meconium ileus or meconium plugs, any other cause for intestinal obstruction, including things like an incarcerated hernia and anorectal malformations in kids who have no obvious fistula or who have a, an intestinal fistula to their urinary system or kids with necrotizing enterocolitis. All of those diagnoses in kids can present with bilious emesis. And actually for many of them, malrotation may be less likely. But it's the thing that you have to rule out before you go down to the pathway of thinking about other diagnoses. The imaging that we use most frequently for the diagnosis of malrotation is an upper GI. And you're really there looking at the position and the course of the duodenum in order to determine whether or not it is normally or abnormally positioned. You wanna see the total of the C loop and actually watch the duodenum come back across the midline to the left. Also, when you look at it from a lateral perspective, you want to see it also go posteriorly and a bit cephalad in order to determine that's really normal position of the duodenum and, and decreases your risk or concern for malrotation. But what about using contrast enema for diagnosing? Some people also think you can use contrast enema sometimes if you're able to determine whether the position of the cecum is normal on a contrast enema. I think our sensitivity and specificity for those studies currently is not sufficient for us to be comfortable using them to rule out a significant pathology, right? We think of mid -get volvulus as the number one surgical emergency in pediatric surgery. And so missing that is a significant problem. And so to this point, they haven't superseded upper GI as the definitive test. The surgical treatment of volvulus is to go to the operating room and do an exploratory laparotomy. You have to actually detorse the bowel. So there's multiple steps when we think about doing a LADS procedure. So there's multiple steps when we think about doing a LADS procedure. And a LADS procedure is the last part of an operation for volvulus. So you're going to make an incision. You're going to eviscerate the bowel in order to be able to determine what you're dealing with, and then derotate or devolvulize the bowel. Which usually requires a 270 degree rotation counterclockwise. And once you've done so, then you're able to give the bowel a rest and actually try to see whether it can pink up again, or whether that ischemia has been going on so long that you're concerned about the viability of the intestine. So Dr. Cartagall believes that it is really important to distinguish malrotation from volvulus. You can have malrotation, which is not a surgical emergency, or a mid-gut volvulus, which is a surgical emergency. And malrotation predisposes you to that mid-gut volvulus. You can't have one without the other, but not all kids who have a malrotation are volvulized. So you can have malrotation without mid-gut volvulus, but you can't have mid-gut volvulus without malrotation. And so once you have done the operation in order to devolvulize the bowel, then you can deal with the LADS procedure, which is an operation for malrotation. And that involves doing a couple of things. The initial thing is widening the mesentery. You want to try to take off as many of those LADS bands that have created a narrow mesentery in order to broaden it as much as possible. Sometimes there are also LADS bands that cause obstruction of the duodenum, and so you want to make sure that you free up and straighten the duodenum to avoid concerns for feeding intolerance related to duodenal obstruction. And in this part of the surgery, a lot of surgeons choose to do an appendectomy. The real driver for taking out the appendix is just knowing that it's going to be in an abnormal anatomic position. And if you leave it in place, you have to remember to tell families that if they present with signs, they need to tell people that their appendix is not in the normal location and that the kid is not rotated. And then after you do that, you're going to put the bowel back into the abdomen in a non-rotation configuration. It's a small bowel on the right, large bowel on the left as a way to the intestines and try to keep that mesentery as broad as possible. 
We know a significant amount of debate as to whether or not a laparoscopic LATS procedure is a good procedure or not a good procedure. And Dr. Cardigal says it depends a little bit on your theory of why you think a LADS works. Some people believe that part of the benefit of doing a LADS procedure is A, you widen the mesentery. But you also cause other scar tissue, helping to the bowel to scar at a confirmation that prevents mid-gut valvulus. So if you're doing a laparoscopic procedure, you have decreased rates of adhesions related to that. It's possible that you might not get that adhesive benefit. That being said, one of the other downsides to doing a LADS procedure is the high rate of intestinal obstruction. So about a quarter of patients who undergo a LADS procedure will have an intestinal obstruction related to small bowel obstruction related to their adhesive bowel disease from their LADS procedure. And so the thought is maybe that doing it laparoscopically reduces that risk of postoperative bowel obstruction. So it's a balance. What I often will do is if I'm concerned in an older child, not a kid who's presenting with mid-gut volvulus, but a kid who has symptomatic malrotation, I might start laparoscopically and determine whether or not I think the mesentery is broad or very narrow, and then look at the duodenum. If I think the mesentery is actually fairly broad, but the biggest problem is bands around the duodenum causing obstruction, I might do that laparoscopically. For cases where the mesentery is very narrow, sometimes Dr. Cardigal thinks that's a harder procedure to do laparoscopically. And there's some controversy about whether you can successfully broaden the mesentery as wide as it should be by a laparoscopic approach. There is some controversy as to whether or not you should or should not do a prophylactic LADS. In a kid with diagnosed malrotation or kids like congenital diaphragmatic hernias, who we know by definition have malrotation because of the long-term risks of bowel obstruction and the complications that can result from that. In general, in younger kids, when they present with malrotation, their likelihood or risk for volvulus is higher or for symptomatic malrotation is higher. And so we tend to fix them or do a LADS procedure more commonly in young kids. But again, those are opportunities to really have good informed consent discussions with families around the risks of both doing or not doing the operation and what they might prefer, and particularly access to care. For families that are much more remote, they might opt for an operation accepting the risk for bowel obstruction, knowing that in the event of an acute volvulus, they would have a much harder time getting to the hospital in a timely fashion. That was all regarding the diagnosis and treatment of malrotation. In this podcast, we reviewed using upper GI for malrotation diagnosis by looking at the position in the course of the duodenum in order to determine whether or not it is normally or abnormally positioned. Also, we talked about surgical treatment of valvulus, which is going to the operating room and doing an exploratory laparotomy. Also mentioned some controversial topics like using laparoscopy for LATS procedure, or if prophylactic LATS procedure is necessary in an asymptomatic child. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Don't forget to follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and download the Stay Current app for more content, including videos, podcasts, and infographics. Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Stay Kern are sharing knowledge to improve child health around the globe.